Good afternoon. This is Pamela, and you're listening to Watchmen on the Pod. We're going to continue in our book reading today of Andrew Murray, Cross of Christ, and we are in Chapter 7, Crucifixion of the Flesh. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Galatians 5.24 They that are Christ have crucified the flesh. It is not must crucify, not do crucify, not seek crucify. No, but have crucified. It is a finished transaction. And it is not they who are holy Christ and fully follow him, not they who are advanced in the Christian life, truly spiritual people. No, the statement is universal. They that are of Christ Jesus are... All who have believed in him, the weakest and the youngest, have crucified flesh. What does this mean? When a man enters through a gate into a long path on which he undertakes to walk to reach to a certain aim, he does not yet know all its difficulties and trials. But if he has honestly, after hearing what has been told him and counting the cost, committed himself to that path, consider him to have accepted all that may come. Even so the believer, when he accepted the crucified Christ as his Savior, accepted the path of the cross to which Christ has bound each of his disciples. He may know but little what it implies, but he has yielded himself to all that believing in and following a crucified Savior implies. And he will find one of the first things Scripture and the Holy Spirit teaches him, that just as the atonement of the cross sets the gate open and faith in it enters in, so the fellowship of the cross is itself the new and living way in which he has to walk. Just as faith in Christ crucified for me is my first step, so, cruci- so Christ crucified living in me, I being crucified with Christ, and like Christ is the mark and power of the life I now live by faith. They that are Christ, they were all in him, and he was crucified. They have all set their seal to it when they accepted him, though they could not yet fully understand that the flesh as sinful deserves the curse, has been condemned to the cross in Christ. The all that is flesh must die. In Christ all flesh, their flesh too, was crucified. In accepting him, they have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Many believers do not know this. They neither know that the flesh needs to be crucified nor that they have given their consent and adjudged their flesh to the cross. The church is suffering inconceivable harm from its ignorance of or silence regarding this truth. The cross of Christ, the cross of Jesus as the crucifixion of our flesh needs to be preached again. Nothing less can give the cross the honor and the place it claims. Nothing less can bring deliverance from the power of the world and sin. And that is this flesh which we are here taught we have crucified. And oh, I'm sorry, let me reread that. And what is this flesh which we were here which we are here taught to have crucified? Generally speaking, it means our fallen human nature, as it is under the power of sin. It manifests itself, first of all, in what are called the sins of the flesh, as the flesh seeks its gratification through the body and its appetites. Thus Paul begins and ends his summing up of the works of the flesh with adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. He then includes with these sins of the body those of the soul, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders. 
But even this is not all. There is a religion of the flesh, which is just as far from God as the sins of the flesh. He warns the Galatians of those who preach circumcision and do away with the offense of the cross as those who make a fair show in the flesh, who glory in the flesh instead of in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a religious flesh as well as a sinful flesh. There is a carnal mind, mind of the flesh, which in its own wisdom thinks it knows the way to serve God. There is a carnal zeal, which is very diligent in striving to carry out its own thought of New Testament religion, without waiting for the teaching of God's Spirit. There is a carnal will, will of the flesh, which, with its resolves and efforts, does its utmost to live a holy life, or to do God's work and wonders at its bad success. The reason is, very simply, that it is the attempt to do in man's wisdom and man's power that the Spirit of God alone can do. All that is of the flesh is equally rejected by God. All that is flesh has been crucified in Christ to make way for the new life of the Spirit. Of all that he does or strives to do in his own, the believer must be brought to accept the teaching. They that are of Christ have crucified the flesh all its affections and desires, all the power of human nature and of self dwelling in it. All the worship and service of God is to be holy in spirit. It is the great need of the church of our day to have this crucifixion of the flesh preached and the cross of Christ restored to its place. It is to be feared with that with all our striving after culture and taste and eloquence and power and preaching, with all our talk of great and attractive services, with all our efforts to win on one hand the cultivated higher classes and on the other hand lapsed masses to our churches, we are putting our confidence in the flesh and preparing for ourselves bitter disappointment. The cross is the power of God, they that are Christ must prove in preaching and living that they have crucified the flesh. It is the cross alone that can give victory. But if this is to be, then believers will need to prove in their life that they have indeed crucified and so are able to conquer passions and lusts of the flesh, whether in the life of the soul or the body. As long as Christians do not prove that all sins against the law of love, hatred, and variance, wrath, and strife, and envying have been crucified, and as such have no dominion. The preaching of the cross, warfare against the carnal religion, or against the carnal life of worldly man will avail little. Before he went to the cross and thence to heaven, Christ prepared for himself a little band of men and women who followed him to death bearing their cross after him. Them he sent in the power of the Spirit to preach the cross. A church in which such ministers and believers are found have power with God and men. The victory over sin against the law of love, all pride, temper, envy, selfishness, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and not come from the flesh. No struggling or effort can gain them. They only come to the crucified, the men who yield themselves to the Holy Spirit, that he may make their crucifixion with Christ, truth, and power. And in no way can the deliverance from the lowest form of lust of the flesh be obtained. Christ bore our sins in his body on the tree. He hath reconciled you in the body of his flesh to present you holy and without blemish for him. It is in the body, too, that the power of his crucifixion and redemption can be known. It is doubtful whether Christians know to what extent gratification of the body, say in eating and drinking for pleasure, may interpret or make impossible unbroken communion with God they desire. 
While we think we are only feeding the body, we may be feeding and strengthening that flesh or self which gains power by every indulgence. To maintain the crucifixion of the flesh every moment, that is what is absolutely needful, if it be true, in our flesh dwelleth no good thing, is what cannot be done in our power. But the Holy Spirit, when he shows us the heavenly blessedness of the likeness to Christ, can give us the will and the heart and courage for it. All our modern ideas of what is needful for comfort or pleasure are the product of the spirit of the world. We have been born and bred in the midst of it and are hardly conscious of how far all its ease and indulgence in daily life invigorates our will and makes us incapable of that true spirituality because in the fruit of the unbroken presence and rule of the spirit. Saints in all ages have complained of the power of evil in their hearts, suggesting thoughts and feelings from which they revolted. They came involuntarily and were utterly beyond their control. Motion of sin in their members, fleshly lust which war against the soul. It is well to remember that these are more closely connected with the state of the body than we think, and that though not to be directly controlled by an act of the will, it can be met by that which is in the power of the will, temperance and abstinence, which keeps the body under. The danger of free and full eating lies not only in its unfitting for direct fellowship with God, but in the stimulus it gives to the flesh in other directions. What indulgences and nourishes it on one side strengthen it as a whole. Nothing can give deliverance in everything and always walk in the faith of our having yielded up all that is of the flesh to crucified Christ. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Know how the power of this life can be formed and maintained. Notice the context. The words lie embedded in the message on the work of the Spirit. They are preceded by the injunction, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The description of the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And then followed by the renewed injunction, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. This being crucified with Christ, which includes the have crucified the flesh is a part of that life in Christ which the Spirit has brought us and which he alone can apply and carry on. All our attempts to crucify the flesh or to keep it crucified are vain. We need the light and joy of the Holy Spirit to show us what is ours in Christ, what has been given in our union with him, and what he himself will make true in our experience. The very thought of having to keep the flesh crucified may be, very often is, as of a burden and a strain and an impossibility. The knowledge and acceptance and faith of the indwelling spirit makes it part of the great salvation God effectually works out in us. Believer, you have the spirit of the living God dwelling in you. All we tell you of the cross and the crucified life and the crucifixion of the flesh is not to tell you what you are to do, what you may confidently expect the Holy Spirit to do in you. It is to show you what his work is. You may be deep humility, you may be in deep humility and entire dependence, but also with joyous faith. Claim and receive it. You do begin at once to believe. Praise God to rejoice that you can do nothing but through the Spirit. You are sure that you can do all things with Christ's Spirit strengthening you. That was very good, actually, brothers and sisters. Wow. Something I've been pondering on for months. 
dying to the flesh, crucifying the flesh. Give it to this Holy Spirit and he will do it in us. Instead of us trying to do it ourselves, which is not good in the eyes of God at all. All right, brothers and sisters, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your nose in the book, which is the word of God. And in bed, the word of God. On the tablets of your hearts, so you will not sin against God or be deceived. Till next time, I love you all so very much. Take this to the Lord in prayer.